Amen. God bless you. You can be seated tonight. I thank you for being faithful to the house of God. Exodus 15 and 1 says, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel. Moses' song is being proclaimed here in Exodus the 15th chapter. He says, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Now he starts singing this after they've been delivered across the Red Sea. And so he now begins to speak of how wondrous the Lord is. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen cap captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou hast sent us forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The floods stood upright as an heap, and the depths were congealed into the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy whim. The sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand. The earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. Amen. Moses sings a song of the greatness of God. He sings a song about a, how God took the enemy that was pursuing God's people and he destroyed them. In verse 9, the enemy said, I will pursue. The enemy said, I will overtake. The enemy said, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. That's what the enemy said. You know, it's quite interesting that archaeologists have discovered the 10-mile stretch. Now, I know I'm probably going to say this incorrectly, but it's called the Nuwaba a Muzana, which means the waters of Moses' opening. And if that's not correct, it's close enough. Brother Myers, would you uh, put that up there? It says Red Sea Crossing there. And just click on that. I just kind of want to give it a, a picture. And so the Red Sea Crossing was a route about 10 miles from Egypt across to Saudi Arabia to an area known as the, the Wilderness of the Red Sea. And I, I, I don't have time to get into all that. That's not the message. But... So, so you could understand there was a 10-mile stretch. Now, Brother Myers, if you'd bring up the next uh, clip, I want to make sure folks understand how it was that the children of Israel were crossing, how close it was from one shore to the other. The next one there, it says, view of the Red Sea crossing there right below it. Go up into the right hand and click on it up there. Because it's a picture of someone looking across from 
the Egyptian side over to the Arabian side. And you can literally see, there it is, the other side. They have found in that 10-mile stretch evidence of chariots, human bones. They have found hoofs of horses. And you can look this up on Google. It's all there. You can... The archaeological site. Scripturally, there's other things I could prove, but, but I just wanted you to be able to see, if you can see that, how they were on one shore looking over to the other shore. Now, there was a garrison of Egyptians along that beach line, so they couldn't go up to the, to the north of that area where they were standing, and there was mountains on the other side, and Pharaoh was behind them. Now, we know that scriptural part of the story. So, here are the children of Israel, a little over a million people begin to cross a 10-mile stretch when God, through his miraculous power, knowing the story of Moses, Moses stretched forth the rod, and the east wind begins to blow, and the, and the water begins to separate. And it's about a half a mile wide is what historians imagine that crossing was. And Now, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, in my spare time, I, I like to read a Louis Lamar or two. And if you don't know who Louis Lamar is, I'll pray for you. But that's a Western book. You know, we're from Texas. So Longhorns mean something to some of us. To some of us, it just means a good steak. But, uh, you know, those trail drives, they didn't go but about, you know, 10, 10, 12, 13 miles a day when you were moving a large herd of animals. Now, those children of Israel, when they crossed that Red Sea, you got to remember, it just wasn't people marching, but they had their herds, they had animals, they had taken all the stuff from Egypt. And they were fleeing for their life. So at some point, this miracle, can you imagine facing that water line with an enemy behind you that wanted to destroy you? And no way of escape. And then God dividing that water. That's just something to think about. And so, as they're going across, those millions of people, I don't think it was just one day. I don't think they all crossed in one day. Yeah, I don't have any biblical proof of how long it took them, okay? It didn't say. It just says they crossed. But as those millions of people were crossing, if it's anything like Houston traffic, but at some point, the vanguard, the rear guard, was just about over. And Pharaoh and his forces said, if they can do it, we can do it. We're not letting them get away. And so at some point, the miracle that God had made for the children of Israel, you find the enemy in the midst of it. You find the enemy in the midst of the miracle that God had created for the children of Israel. And the enemy was saying, I'm going to get you. I will pursue you. Uh, I will overtake you. Uh, I will take the, divide the spoil of you. I'll satisfy my lust upon thee. He said, everything I can do to you, I'm going to do to you. But you got to remember something. When the enemy is in the midst of your miracle, it is not for him. It is for you. Now, I want to build this so I can preach it tonight. God has a miracle for you. And the enemy's going to try to get in the middle of it. But honey, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to doubt. You don't have to unbelieve. Because if God is making a way of escape for you, he's going to get you to the other side. You just got to trust in the Lord and believe him and know that you know that he is going to be more than able to deliver you. Hallelujah. I can imagine some of those uh, 
that were in the rear guard there. I am sure that some of those, uh, amen, they say that it was uh, 3,000 feet and 5,000 feet around them. I'm sure that some of those that were crossing over that water and they looked up and saw the enemy coming. They heard the sound of the horses. They heard the sound of the armor clanking upon the, seal, the shields, upon the swords, and, and the soldiers were coming to devour them. I'm sure those that were in the rear guard were pushing. Get on through. There's mountains. If we can get to the mountains, we can hide. I didn't say they were full of faith. That's how some of us are. Even though God's doing a miracle in our life, things are happening that we never thought would happen. Amen. The enemy says, I'm still going to mess you up. And some of us still get a little worried. Wait, God's doing miracles and God's doing healings and God's doing this and God's doing that. But, but, uh, but I can still hear the enemy. And yet God said, I've got your miracle. It's right here. I'm bringing you to the other side. You're going to come through it. I've opened the waters. You know how the story goes. That when the enemy got in the midst of the miracle, God said the miracle's not for you. And all of a sudden, the waters that were standing up came down. And there's Proof today uh, that the chariots uh, are still in the bottom of the sea uh, and the soldiers uh, were still at the bottom of the sea. Uh, come on now, somebody. I'm trying to build your faith tonight uh, that when the enemy gets in the midst of your miracle, you don't have to be afraid. Just trust in the Lord. Hallelujah. He likes to control us with fear and doubt and unbelief. He likes to control us. Yes, he does. He likes to play mind games with us. It's kind of what it was for David and Israel soldiers in 1 Samuel 17 and 24. And all the men of Israel when they saw the man, fled from him, and were sore afraid. When they saw him, when they saw him, they were afraid. You ever seen somebody and been afraid of them? You know, I used to, I used to be intimidated by Mike Tyson back in the day till I heard him talk. What y'all laughing about? I mean, when I was a teenager, he was a he was coming. I mean, he was strong. I mean, he knocked guy out in ninety one seconds. Michael Spinks knocked him clear out of the ring. Then out of the fight, Michael, what'd you think about that? Well, I thought it was really good. I said, what's wrong with that man? I'd probably still give him some room, you know, if he walked into the building. Because <laughs> he may talk real high pitch, but he still can knock somebody out. But you know what? Sometimes... We look at things and, and we get intimidated by them when we shouldn't let them d intimidate us. Especially in the spirit world. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up? And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free and in Israel I mean they were they were intimidated it's kind of like Mike Tyson everybody was intimidated when they got in the ring with him till Buster Douglas now, I know some of y'all don't have a clue what I'm talking about Buster Douglas was I mean he he was kind of a scab for lack of a better word he he wasn't somebody that they were talking a lot about. He really wasn't an up-and-comer. 
Not in boxing. But when he got in the ring, he forgot to be afraid. When he got in the ring, he forgot all the hype. Everybody said, you get in the ring with Ty Hinnock, yeah, look at all he's done. He said, well, I'm just here to fight. He don't care about the hype. You know, David got to the battlefield, and I mean, everybody was already afraid. Nobody was wanting to step into the ring with Goliath because of all the hype. Do you know sometimes we get caught up in the hype of things, and we lose the battle before it even begins? Huh? I mean, that's trash talk, right? That's getting in somebody's head. I mean, that's some elementary stuff. Getting in somebody's head and you got them. Whether you're better than them or not, if you can get in their head, they're already mentally defeated. And that's how the devil does a lot of us. He gets into our head. He makes himself appear bigger and badder than everybody else. That's what Goliath did. He was a big man, and so he walked on a battlefield. I mean, he already had the Israelis trembling before they even stepped onto the battlefield with him. So here comes this little old guy, you know, bringing food for his brothers, been out with the sheep, uh, you know, and he, he comes in with a little swagger, and he's like, who's this dude? Who's this guy that's defiling the armies of Israel? David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You know what? Who does the enemy think he is? Coming into your house, messing with your family. Who does the enemy think he is coming into your business and trying to cause trouble in your life? I want to remind some folks who you are. Sister Robin, she had a shirt on this afternoon. Said, I'm a princess. Said, she's the child of the king. Is that what that shirt said? Come on now. I'm a prince of God. I'm a child of the king. Come on. We're princes. I mean, we're, we're royalty. We're a chosen generation and a royal priesthood. I'm a king's kid. We got to realize Who's on our side? Sometimes it's an attitude thing for us. Huh? Mom's been battling cancer for 12 years. Y'all's very familiar with that. But you know what, brother? Not one time have I heard her complain about it. Not that I can recall. And you know what? It's an attitude thing. She's looking at that giant square in the eye and saying, you're not going to get the better of me. I called her the other day and we talked. I was running down the road. We were talking. And she said, you know, I called that old doctor and said, look, I'm going to camp meeting. I don't have time for a uh, chemo treatment this week. We'll do it the next week. If that's what you want to do, Miss Bumgarner, that's what I want to do. I'm going to church. Sometimes it's all about your attitude, how you approach it. You're going to let that big old giant of cancer hold you back? No, I, as long as there's breath in my body, I'm going to praise the Lord. The enemy can get in the middle of my miracle and try to stop me, but I'm still going to praise the Lord. I'm still going to lift him up. I'm still going to magnify his name. Hey, I some of you better realize hey man it's all about your attitude if you get your attitude right then God can complete the miracle David David why can't it be your big brother when we read in Samuel when David was getting anointed king that his brothers were all big 
handsome fellas, warriors. I mean, they were the top stock. And God passed by all of them. And he said, I'll tell you why. They may look like it on the outside, but they don't got no heart. Some of you got to realize it ain't all about looking like it on the in outside, but it's about having the heart on the inside to say, God, you're in control of my life, of my circumstance, of my situation, and where you lead me, I will follow. David's attitude was, why should I be afraid of this uncircumcised Philistine? He's not an Israelite. He doesn't serve the one true God. So why should I be afraid of him? He who would defy the armies of the Most High God. Come on now. Had a friend get on Facebook says, well, what did the five stones mean? So me being funny like I am sometimes, I said, one in the chamber. Four in the mag. David was the first member of the NRA. <laughs> he was ready. And maybe, you know, the first one didn't get him. He wanted to be prepared to get him with the next one. Some said it's because he had to spell out Jesus. I'll never forget somebody preaching a message. J-E-S-U-S. And others said because he's had four brothers and he won't take care of them too. I don't know why he picked up five stones. All I know is he picked up five stones and he was ready. And he didn't come to him with a bad attitude. He didn't come to him with fancy light shows. He didn't come to him with smoke rising out of the stage and flashing lights and boom, boom music. I enjoy good worship. <laughs> but there's one way to get the enemy on the run. You come to me with sword and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. It's an attitude thing. Some of you battling some things. The enemy's coming against you trying to create doubt and unbelief. You need to get an attitude that says, Devil, you're the liar and the father of all liars. And I will not be afraid of you. But I am going to trust in the Lord. My miracle belongs to me. I'm a child of God. He will not let me down. But he will bring me over to the other side. Your, your, you know, your giants may be finances. Your giants may be sicknesses. Your giants may be, you know, uh, somebody at the job giving you a hard time. Your giants may be all kinds of individuals. Brother Teeman, you got to back me up on this one because they're not here. They're on a cruise. Sister Brandy, she said, uh, Talking about somebody on her job that was very offensive. Giving her a hard time. I don't know who else heard this story. It was giving her a hard time. So Brother Thomas said, well, let's just pray about it. They started praying about it. And after they prayed about it, I believe it was 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Somebody giving her a hard time. Some ugly old spirit coming around that was making her uncomfortable. But don't you know greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world? Ten minutes after she prayed, the boss come in and said, You, you know, you've I gotta let you go. There's too much going on. You've you fired. Don't tell me that prayer doesn't work. So I don't know what you're battling. But I promise that this, if you get your attitude where it's supposed to be with God and let God fight your battles. 
See, God's trying to do things in your life, but the enemy's constantly trying to get in the middle of the miracles that God is trying to do in your life. But if you'll begin to praise him despite the circumstance and despite what is going on, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. Come here, young man. I want you to know I love this young man. But the enemy comes against him a lot of times because he's working with our young people. Because he's trying to do what he can to help them. You ought to pray for him. Because the enemy's trying to destroy his spirit and destroy his mind and, and try to discourage him. But you know what? Uh, don't worry, Brother Staines. Uh, God's still got your miracle. Uh, God's still got great things in store for you. We don't ever see it. He's always got a kind word for everybody. He's always on the upbeat. But you know what? The enemy's attacking him. The enemy's coming against him. And yet he keeps plowing ahead. Don't worry, son. I believe God's got something for you that you're not even going to be able to handle. Hallelujah. I believe that tonight. I'm telling you, you just need to let God be God tonight. It's not super spiritual discernment. It's just knowing the times we live in. We're all battling things. We're all going through things. They're around us in our neighborhood. They try to come into our homes. That's why I try to preach to this church, protect your homes, protect your homes, protect your homes. Not against a physical enemy, but against a spiritual enemy. Oh, we're on guard for the physical enemies. Uh-huh. Sister Teresa got me a sign to put on my front door that says we don't call 911. I was very thankful for that. But Sister Bumgarner wanted to back it up, so she made sure the alarm system's on at night. And it does go off at 2.30 in the morning when a frog jumps on the window. Wakes me up, and then I'm up for the rest of the night because I'm looking for a boogeyman. Yeah. But you know what? If, if the alarm system doesn't work and the sign doesn't scare them, then the 12-gauge will. Right, right. I mean, we protect our physical home. I mean, castle law. You're a thief on my property, I catch you. Like the old boy that found somebody in his garage, he called the officer and said, hey, somebody's in my garage stealing all my stuff. Well, I'm sorry, we don't have any officers available. Give us about 30 minutes. Man hung up the phone, waited about 30 seconds, called back, says, don't worry, it's all taken care of. He's here laying on the ground waiting for you. Two minutes later, all these cops showed up. Caught the man in the garage and arrested him for stealing. And the cop got upset at the man and said, I thought you said he was taken care of and gone. He said, I thought you didn't have an officer available. Well, we're good at protecting our physical property. I mean, we get alarms on our cars. You know, you bump the door and they go off. They even speak to you now. They got the one called the Cobra, you know. You get too close to it, and it says, back away from the car. So we're, we're real good at protecting our physical stuff. But what about our spiritual soul? Are you really on guard about what's coming into your spiritual life? Are you really guarding your eyes? Your eyes are the window of the soul. Why do you think the old timers took such a strong stand against television and Hollywood? Why do you think they took a strong stand against all that? Because they understand the eyes are the window of the soul. And what you're watching, amen, penetrates through the eyes to the very depths of your soul. So whatever spirits uh, that are coming across that screen, whether they be adultery or fornication or homosexuality,
You can shut down on me all you want, but I'm going to tell you something. They're there, and they're penetrating. And my question is tonight, uh, amen, you're good at guarding everything else, but what about your soul? Uh, are you good at guarding your home from the spirits uh, that would come in and defile your children and defile the little ones? Because the enemy, you know, the miracle in the home is that that child rises up and takes this message to the next generation. But if the enemy can get in the midst of that and destroy that child, he will. You know how I know that? Because there were three Hebrew boys by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were ordered to bow down. Everybody else was doing it. Mama, you ever heard that? Mom, everybody else is doing it. Well, I'm just like everybody else. Everybody else is doing it. You know, we're so good at justifying. And look, I know how teenagers can be. Because I have some of them. Them boys, they, they want to push old pa Well, not dad, not pastor, dad. Oh, dad, come on. Son, I drew a line a long time ago. I drew a line. I drew a line in holiness a long time ago. That's why I wear long britches. And I wear sweatpants. It's a line. And you start moving lines, then you give up ground. And you keep pushing yourself further and further back. Well, uh, and, and see, so you got a, you got a, you got a problem here because I believe in modesty. I teach about modesty. I preach about modesty. And they'll say, but dad, the shorts are to the knees. Now, maybe y'all don't have this conversation, but I have this conversation. I got two boys that are trying to stretch the limits a little bit, trying to get dad to pull the fence back. And I tell them, hey, when you sit down, and ladies, this goes for you too. If you sit down in that skirt, is above the knees. It's not modest. I, I'm not even preaching on holiness. I'm talking about not letting the enemy get your victory. But young men, I drew a line. And I'm not going to change my position on that line. Amen. The United Pentecostal Church International can change their position on that line. But I'm not changing my position on my line. There were some forefathers and some elders that put something in me. And they said, look, boy, now we got this line, this fence is built for you. And we've kept it clean now. It's your job to keep the fence clean now. And I'm going to keep keeping that fence clean. And I can't always say my sons or my daughters may always up here to that fence line, but it's going to be there. And my prayer is one of them says, Dad, when I'm an old man, you don't have to worry about the fence line anymore because I'm going to keep the fence line clean. Now we understand, Dad, you did it for us. You did it to keep the wrong stuff out and the right stuff in. Because as you begin to compromise, you allow the enemy in an inch, he'll take a yard. And what one generation does in moderation, the next generation does in excess. It's proven. You can go online and you can look from generation to generation. You know, there was a day when an officer manned the beaches. Do your history. Let's study your history. There was a day when a man uh, manned the beaches, an officer. And if a woman was considered immodest, she'd get a ticket. She'd get sent home. 
Now they go to the beaches and lingerie and everything's okay. Oh, I know we changed the name of it. Still lingerie. But who's going to draw a line? Because the enemy's getting all into your business. God wants to give you revival. God wants to give you blessing. God wants to pour out a miracle on you. God wants to get you to the other side. And yet, you know, we, we allow the enemy into the midst of our miracle. He hinders what God's going to do. Just a thought. Back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were said, you're going to bow. You're going to compromise. You're going to either bow and worship this false god, or you're going into the fire. And they said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. They didn't even think about it. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship in the golden image which thou hast set up. I love their attitude. I love their mindset. We're not even careful to answer. But God will deliver us. But if he doesn't. You know, sometimes we just have to say, uh, you know, whether God gets in the middle of our situation or not, uh, we know uh, he's able to deliver us. Uh, whether we die by the fire or we make it through the fire, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to praise the Lord anyhow. Uh, you can throw me in a fire, but I'm going to worship him. And you know the story. They got thrown into the fire, and the fire was so hot that the guards that threw them in got consumed by the fire and died. But here they were, walking in the middle of the fire. And there's one in there that looks like the Son of Man. Oh, my won't you worship with me tonight and believe that God is able to get into the middle of your situation? He's able to deliver to set free. You say, but boy, they're bad, Brother Bumgarner. My children are bad. Keep praying. Keep believing. Keep seeking God. Keep having you some old-time prayer meetings in that house. Amen. Get your mind made up to clean house. I don't even know where that came from. But maybe some of you need to clean house. You tired of battling the same things over and over? Why don't you clean house and get rid of some things, get rid of some spirits that have been there for too long? Yeah, amen. You know what made Daniel so great? Daniel was a Praying man. I heard a song, Brian Free and Assurance. And it simply says this Never throw a hungry lion into a den with a praying man. Never throw a hungry lion into a den with a praying man. Now there were those that were coming against Daniel. They were moving and shaking and politicking. They were going behind his back uh, trying to get the king's ear. Come on now, somebody. You know why I don't worry about things? I know who's got my back. And I know some of these men have my back. I know, but I know who re really has got my back. <laughs> Jesus said, you do your part, I'll do my part. Uh, you don't have to worry what's behind you as long as you're facing forward, son. So I don't worry about the manipulators. Uh, I don't worry about the backbiters. Uh, I don't worry about the gossipers. Uh, I don't worry about them who's trying to mess me up because uh, I know who's on my side. I know who's watching my back. Uh, I know who will mess with you if you mess with me. 
Now, I ain't trying to stand up here and act. I'm just telling you, I know who I serve. I know who's been with me all the way. I know who's never left me nor forsaken me. I know who, when I cried out, he heard my cry. <laughs> Daniel, we got you now, buddy. We caught you praying. Yeah, that's what I do. So we're going to throw you into the lion's den. Well, really, you're just going to turn the loose the lions in my den because it's going to become a place of prayer. <laughs> they threw Daniel in the lion's den. We know the story. The angel of the Lord came and shut their mouth. Now, we, we, we're so comfortable. I mean, we think getting a fever blister is crisis 101. Huh? Some of you ladies wake up in the morning with a fever blister. I mean, the first thing you're going to do is go, Oh, my word! I gotta go to CVS right now. I gotta get me some medicine. Oh, look at this. oh, it's oh, it's terrible. Oh, it's terrible. Lord, help me, Jesus, right now. In the name of Jesus, touch this fever blister. Okay, Lord, you didn't do anything. I'm going to CVS. That's how we pray a lot of times, huh? Brother Husband said it right. You know, we we haven't really known a, a famine or a hard time. But there is great revival that comes through a hard time. You really know that you can trust in the Lord when you've gone through a hard time and he's come through for you. Daniel, what are you doing? I'm just down here sleeping. Some of these lions make great pillows. They're purring, just put me to sleep. And the king stayed up all night while Daniel slept. The king realized he had been manipulated. The king realized he had been tricked. So when he come to the pit, Daniel! When I was a little boy, there was this puppet named Danny. And he and this sister told the story of Daniel lying down. And Danny said, he played Daniel, he said, Oh, king, live forever! I loved it. It made an impression on me that lasted a lifetime. Oh, King, live forever. For the God that I've been praying to. Don't you realize who you've been praying to? Some of y'all need financial miracles. Don't you realize who you've been praying to? Come on, the wolf's at the door and saying they're going to devour you. But the God of heaven says, don't worry. I'm fixing to supply all your needs according to my riches and glory. I got you. I got you. Oh, king, live forever. King said, get him out of there. And then you go find all the manipulators uh, and all those that were backbiters uh, and all of those that were trying to twist words and twist my words and cause me to sign a decree that I knew a man would cause another man his life. You go get them and you put them into this lion's den. And the enemy that came against Daniel was thrown into the very death that he was trying to bring upon him. I'm telling somebody that you don't have to be afraid. But if you'll pray and seek God, your miracle will come through. Your miracle will come through. Some of you battle sickness, but your miracle will come through. The enemy tries to stop us. Look at Gideon. I mean, look at Gideon. He's hiding. He's on a threshing floor and he's hiding. Oh, Gideon, thy mighty man of valor. Who, me? 
Come on, Gideon. It's time to go to fight. Look, they steal from us. They rob us. They do all kinds of unspeakable things to us. And we hide. We don't fight. We hide. I'm just trying to get enough to take care of my family. Oh, I feel like preaching. The enemy has some of us so afraid that we come to the house of God and the Lord begins to speak to us and He begins to say, Oh, Sarah! You mighty young woman of war, of worship. I still believe in you. But we got to be careful because what we do. Who, me? I'm just here, you know, just feel, I'm just trying to get enough to make it to Wednesday. I'm not saying that's you. I'm just saying that's us. I'm just trying to get, get, my, get my little bit. I'm just trying to, hey, if I can just get through tonight, if I can just get home and make it through Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at work, then I'll come back Wednesday try to get me a little bit more. But me, a mighty woman of valor, me, a mighty man of war, Men, we got to step it up. I mean, we got to step it up and pray. We got to get serious about this spiritual warfare. I mean, the Amalekites are all around us. The enemy's trying to destroy us, not us, but our families. And the, the Lord's coming to you and saying, Hey, you mighty warrior of God, rise up! And the story about Gideon, what's so awesome is, he finally says, okay, I'll go to war. But then God says, you got too many. What? So, you know, any newlyweds, any got children, just send them home. Man, don't, you know, the old, just send them home. And so, the, you still got too many. What? And that's how some of us are. Lord, I mean, you're taking everything away from me. Lord, I feel like I'm losing everything. Now, maybe I'm just preaching to me tonight. Uh, Lord, it feels like uh, the whole world's turning upside down, and, and, and I'm trying to get some victory, and you say I still got too much, too much of me, too much of flesh. Lord, if I die any more to this flesh, there won't be nothing left of me. No comments from the peanut gallery. But that's where we're at. And finally he's down to 300. And he's facing thousands. Get in. I'm going to show you something. Come on, get in. And the Lord took Gideon and he walked him down into the midst of those Amalekites. He walks him down into the midst of them. And all of a sudden he hears, get in. He's strong. Gideon's going to defeat us. We're not ready for this battle. Do you know what that's the enemy saying in your life? The enemy's just saying, all they got to do is praise Jesus and they're going to get victory. All they got to do is let go and let God and God's going to open the house up. All they got to do is stop fretting and fussing with that child and start praying and anointing them and believing God's going to do something in their life. And God's going to, if they just start praising God, something's going to happen. Because the enemy knows if you ever realize who you are. When was the last time you shouted? talking about just coming up here when the spirit was feeling right but when was the last time you shouted in victory oh but brother Bumgarner it's got to be just right and it's got to hit me just right and I mean the, the, the piano's got to hit a certain note and the singer's got to hit a certain tune and and uh, you know it's got everything got to be right and I'll shout that's why some of us don't have more victory 
Because we have to be worked up into a shout instead of coming to church with a shout. Uh, I'm, pre I'm passionate, Madeline, but you know what? Uh, I'd rather come in the house of God with a praise on the inside and a shout in my step and tell the devil I may be a fool tonight and people may make fun of me, but I'm going to worship the Lord. I'm going to praise the Lord. You're not getting into the midst of my miracle. Come on now. The devil can't stand it when you begin to praise him. And that's what they did. Come on now. Get in his men. They begin to praise God. They begin to sound the trumpet. They begin to bust open the jugs of water. And all of a sudden, fear gripped the enemy. And the enemy began to attack themselves. And 300 mighty men of Gideon walked into an Amalekite's camp that had been deserted. And they won the victory. I'm trying to tell somebody. Stop letting the enemy get your victory. Stop letting the enemy get in the middle of your miracle and let God do what he wants to do for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm tired of the devil. Causing people stress over things that they shouldn't be stressed about. Oh, but you're nothing but a failure. You're nothing but a failure. You're nothing but a drug dealer. You're nothing but a whoremonger. I could go on. Isn't that what the devil tells us? He's good at telling you all your failures. He's good at letting you know all the things you used to be. But I tell him, thank you, Jesus, I'm not what I used to be. I've been bought with a price. Micah said it like this. Rejoice not against me. Oh, mine enemy, when I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Some of you need to stop letting the enemy get in the middle of your business, and you need to let the devil know, rejoice not against me. Oh, my enemy, I may fall, but I'm getting back up. Sometimes it's not about how much you give, but it's what you take and keep getting back up. Wait, I made a mistake. I, I did something I shouldn't do. Lord, would you forgive me? I'm getting back up. If you can ever understand, it ain't the getting down. It's the getting back up. Because we fall down, but we get up. We fall down, but we get up. We fall down, but we get up. Because a saint is nothing but a sinner who falls down, but gets back up. <laughs> Come on, I'm coming to a close tonight. But I'm trying to encourage a saint of God. I know you fall. I know you make mistakes. I know that we all struggle in life. But it's not the getting down that's going to hurt you. It's get back up. Get back up. I wanted you to know I'm coming to a close. Sister Louise, if you'll come tonight, I want you to pick up from this morning. I won't turn back. I can't stop praising. Some of us, I know you struggle. Some of us say things we regret. Some of us do things we regret. 
Some of us, God's trying to do a miracle in your family. And it's like every time you get a little victory, the enemy comes and knocks you back down. But I feel like I need to tell you, get back up. Will you stand to your feet tonight? Now I can start naming some names that God has kind of gave me some insight. But I'm going to challenge you. They're going to start playing this song. I'm going to challenge some of you to get out of your pew and just begin to worship the Lord. Begin to magnify the Lord. Begin to take back dominion over the territory that the enemy has taken from you. I won't turn back. I won't turn back. I won't turn back.